I'm just presenting uh, uh, a small project that I've been working on the sideline. And the idea is essentially uh, to monitor websites for malware injection. And the name of the project is Web Detector. I might change the name so it's not that important. So, um, so my pre I'm not a pen tester or like a security kind of traditional security analyst, but I did most of my work. It was in the early days of, uh, you know, pre Windows era. I was working a lot of uh, on uh, doing key gens, uh, mostly illegal stuff. But uh, <laughs> uh, it was from a security, like it was from a study point of view. So, like to see, you know, how much vulnerable was software, um, uh, and the probably well, like at the time there was the I was working on basically the first uh, bytecode patcher for, for Java Mobile. And there were, at the time, there were a lot of words running on uh, Java phones. Uh, that was quite fun. Uh, but my research is mainly on uh, machine learning and, the, uh, and social robotics, which has nothing to do with security, of course. Uh, um, so I, uh, I recently, so I did some work on, uh, with previous companies in security, just purely from, the, uh, from a research point of view. Uh, and I'm currently working for Microsoft, which is a little bit, you know, it's very really strange. I've always been a Linux user, so. Uh, but uh, it's quite interesting on the, on the research side, like, you know, there is this kind of perception of Microsoft as a kind of very conservative company, but uh, internally there is a lot of research. Um, and so I fo I'm focusing on uh, machine learning applied to intrusion, intrusion detection and big data and security. Uh, and, you know, like, were quite, uh, I was quite in, uh, intrigued by Microsoft. They, they allowed me to do carry my own research project. So, uh, and this project in particular is based on open source tools. And yes, yeah, everybody is happy that you know, like somebody's working on like not Microsoft technology inside. And maybe one day we, you know, there will be an exchange uh, between <laughs> uh, closed or uh, open software. So it's quite interesting um, the way Microsoft works. Uh, so the problem is that. Uh, what do we want to solve is like, like ask yourself how many websites are compromised, uh, lots of them, and uh, what are the most common attack vectors, and how can we monitor a website and say, like for a website that just mean anything, like very simple stuff, like if you have a board, if you are, if you're a small company, you have some blogs, you have like uh, your front facing corporate website, you have uh, maybe an e-commerce card, you know, like very, you know, very, like wide variety of like website just you know that you expose to your customers or into the web um, so you know yeah you can buy these expensive solutions uh, from different companies you know to do application layer security and that kind of stuff but I wanted to have something very simple so I wanted to have something that like a common user a common, a common uh, IT web admin can you know can install on his computer and say oh well, let's see let's see like you know, every month I want to crawl my own website, and if there is something uh, different, like there was a new page added, there are like there were new links, uh, new modules. I want to know if that's me, like updating the website, or like it was an up, uh, an update for WordPress, or it was actually somebody was injecting some JS. Uh, you know, there was some cross-site scripting that I'm not aware of. And some of the time, like most of the times, I mean, depends on the attacker. Like you might get, you know, it, it might not something be so evident. So you might be something polluting your like web directories with malware, like uh, that is used for spamming, so for distributing uh, malware and that kind of stuff. So it's not that easy, you know, to actually see. Okay, I'm browsing my own website. Oh, that's something strange. So it's yeah. So that was the, the idea, like very basic, very basic detection of uh, changes in your website, and you know, look for like very basic attacks. I'm not doing any kind of uh, sophisticated analysis on the. Uh, on your web on, on a website so um, so the, the, you know we have three components so one we have, we need to know like you know we need to have a way to uh, monitor changes in your website we need to have some sort of uh, js sand sandboxing environment so uh, to kind of emulate uh, your scripts <laughs> uh, uh, you know uh, with, with the uh, without the risk of getting infected yourself uh, and some basic heuristics to detect uh, these kind of attack vectors uh, this was um, a report from Whitehead in 2013. 
Uh, I didn't do the 2014 because they didn't want to pay for, <laughs> for the money, but you can buy, I think they can, they can do how much money was that. But, you know, it's, uh, I don't know how they, uh, the, how they actually measured, like, you know, this percentage, uh, these numbers, so, but yeah, they were quite interesting. So they were saying, you know, the big picture is like 86% of all websites uh, you know, were compromised uh, with an increase of 4% from the last year. Uh, and, you know, there were like 56 uh, of these websites that, you know, serious vulnerabilities. Uh, yeah, just some interesting numbers. Um, and obviously the most common vulnerability now is XSS. I remember in the past was at, uh, SQL injection, uh, but now it's kind of, you know, become more popular, I, th I think, because JavaScript is taking over. So there's a lot of dynamic uh, web development going on. Uh, Interesting things like education, healthcare, and insurance are the one with the slower fix. So <laughs> healthcare has a 226 days of average fix. That's quite a lot. <laughs> uh, but yeah, surprisingly in government, it's quite fast. So like they, on average, uh, they have a 48 delays in fixing things. Uh, and entertainment media, which probably is where all the profit is, they're quite, fi uh, they're quite fast. 33 gaming, surprisingly, is like 67 days. So it kind of varies, but yeah, the bigger idea is like, well, we have a lot of uh, vulnerable websites and, you know, we want to find a way to kind of monitor them, especially for XSS. Um, so that's a kind of distribution. I mean, again, it's a report from, this was like 2011, so you can download it, you don't have to pay for that. Um, and yeah, as I said, 50%, it's cross-site scripting. 14% uh, it's content spoofing. I think there's a typo there, it's not my typo. Uh, and yeah, intrusion like leakage and SQL injection went down to 4%, which is quite interesting. Um, there are like three types of uh, cross-site scripting. I'm not here to lecture you about, you probably know about this. Uh, so it's store, reflecting, and DOM-based. There are several vectors. So there's JS, PDF, uh, so Adobe PDF, uh, ActiveX, iFrame, and Shockwave. Um, and for the purpose of monitoring, uh, the only way that I have to detect uh, XSS is for storage, uh, storage side cross-site scripting because we are not, so the idea is I'm not actively probing your website to find like vulnerable point, point of injection. I'm just basically looking at your, you know, uh, HTML pages and see, oh, uh, somebody might have done some sort of uh, cross-site scripting. And the only way I have to do that, uh, I can do that is because, you know, it was stored on your server and then it's just played back on my browser. And I can, when I pass the page, I'm able to find like strange things. Uh, and there are like basic behaviors that you can detect. Again, nothing really complicated. So I can find, you know, it's quite obvious if there was a, a new URL injection for, to a malware dropper. Um, if there was a form injection for phishing, uh, page redirection and uh, cookie stealing or like, yeah, any, any form of cookie manipulation is kind of suspicious. Um, So the very first, the uh, very first version version of my uh, kind of tool was very basic. So I was using basically wget uh, uh, with some sort of uh, Python script. No, it was like bash scripting. So I was getting a mirror of your website. I was applying Git on top of that, so I could see the changes. You know, it was basic. It's basically your source code is your uh, you know is your web web page resources, and I was getting Git on top of that. So I, like. Uh, Every new uh, pool of your website, it was a git commit, so I can actually see what was changing and what was not changing. And then on these diffs, I was applying this heuristic to say, oh, there's a new IP is pointing outside, or oh, there is a new strange uh, JavaScript, ob obfuscated JavaScript code running on this new page. Uh, that, that looks very suspicious. The problems were that the problem was that the uh, wget, okay, it's a very nice tool, very fast. It's available on every Linux box, but it's not that good at crawling, especially for dynamic pages. So I was crawling, you know, like WordPress sites, and uh, there were so many pages that I couldn't fetch because it was like all dynamic, uh, dynamic content. So it so the, so when wget was running, it wasn't sending post requests to request that page, and it was like I was getting basically like say 10% of the entire website so was missing really, uh, you know, 90% of pages were not being crawled properly. Um, so what do we want to know? We want to know what was added, what was removed from the website, when did that happen? So it's really important because 
if there was an admin was doing some updates, then we know that, oh, that day, you know, the admin was adding a new page. So that's probably what it was, you know. That's essentially to reduce false positive. Um, who did it? Okay, that's a little bit more complicated. So uh, it's hard to say. Uh, and then essentially, like, is it, is it, is it malicious behavior or is like some sort of uh, new library that was added and, you know, was somehow was obfuscated or was like uh, minified. So we don't want to kind of flag that continuously to reduce the false positives. So the architecture is quite simple. Um, you basically give, uh, so you have a job queue, you get all your URL, uh, URLs or, dom or domains that you want to monitor. It goes into Eritrix, uh, which is a web crawler. Eritrix produce a sort of compressed mirror of your website. They have an ingester that takes this kind of output. So they have two file formats with WARC or the old, uh, the old one is ARC. The ingesters uh, kind of index the entire thing in a MySQL database. It can be any other database. I just use that because, it, yeah, I was familiar with the uh, MIS MySQL. So for each resource, you get an index, you, you get timestamps, you, you get a fingerprint, like, uh, uh, you know, like um, an hash uh, for, for, you, for each new resource. And then from there, I start to do a little bit of uh, profiling. So I want to know, so for each page, I want to see uh, the JavaScript, uh, what kind of JavaScript were, was running on that page. Uh, if, if the JavaScript was manipulating the DOM, which is the kind of structure of your XML or your HTML page, uh, I run another analysis to see um, how the DOM was used, if it was, if, you know, if it was doing something tricky. And to do that, there is a tool called Tag. Um, and after that, so after these kind of three steps, I produce a report. Uh, unfortunately, nothing is n nothing really visual at the moment, so it's like just very basic CSV uh, files that you can open. Uh, and I also store everything on a MongoDB because it's flexible, so you can add, you know, it's schema-less, so you can add new attributes as you do your crawling. If you have new features to put in your database, you can, e you can easily add those kind of things. So does everybody know what Mongo is or Eritrix or how many people that did use Eritrix before? Oh gosh. <laughs> okay. Uh, so and so right. Eritrix is just is your web crawler so they can yes. get to website. Yes. Uh, quick question, I'm sorry this is a premature, sure. but Thug, is that then doing going essentially an Ajax crawler so they can go? Yeah, I can show I can I can I can show you later. So there are a number of technologies I use. So everything sits on a virtual box, you know, just there are two reasons why I want to have something that was easy to deploy and destroy. Uh, and then uh, the security, obviously, you know, if you're crawling things and there is malware, you don't want your own box polluted with some sort of malware. <laughs> uh, so you don't want that. Uh, so, on to so, you know, if you think about layers, there is virtual box is the kind of execution environment. Then you have Vagrant. I don't know how many people did use Vagrant before. I'm just curious. Oh, there, there are people. Know about so for, so Vagrant is essentially, um, a set of tools to kind of make your uh, job easier when you set up a virtual box. So, you know, if you think about you installing a new image, uh, say an Ubuntu, uh, you know, an Ubuntu environment. So you have to install that on your virtual box and you install your tools. So you need to do that kind of manually and it takes so much time. But Vagrant allows you to make it everything automatic. So you build a script, set of scripts that can be well, to make it, you build a script and you say, okay, I want to install, I want to deploy this particular version of Ubuntu and I want, I want to install, say, Java, Python, Perl, uh, you know, all the software that you need on that machine, it will set up for you all the nothing, so like all the port forwarding, it will create an SSH, um, an SSH um, uh, configuration so you can log into the box. It's just like a way to make it, you know, to deploy a, a box and install everything you want, to, uh, you want on that one. So main technologies is Python, uh, Java, and V8 for Google, and you will see why. And then obviously there is Tor, so like I use Tor for anonym, uh, anonymization because you know, when you do these kind of crawling jobs, uh, <laughs> there are some, uh, you know, most of the uh, malware sits on unfortunately pornographic websites, so you, don't <laughs> you know, you don't want to be, I had some, uh, it was some interesting situations when I forgot to turn on Tor, and you know, the, uh, your IT admin will not be very happy. <laughs> so, <laughs> So now you are crawling an entire porn website, like 
What's that for? Is <laughs> yeah, for research, yeah. <laughs> so, so Eritrix, uh, it's, yeah, it's quite interesting. Not so many people know about this, but it was the, it w it's the only project, well, it's one of the main tools that the W3C um, uh, organization, organization have used to crawl the web. So if you, if you go on, um, I think it's called the historical web database of the internet, they use this Eritrix uh, software uh, to pull, like, so they essentially crawl important websites uh, and you can see them uh, back in time. So you can see, okay, let's see how Facebook looked like in nine, uh, 2000 or something like that. So they don't have all websites. I don't know, I don't know if it's the, what kind of political correct version is to define what's, uh, what the important website is, but they, they, they have, a, you know, like fairly a good amount of big websites and they crawl them with this software. So it's well developed. So the last version was in January 2014. So they, they, you know, it's well maintained, there are a lot of plugins. It's a very good uh, efficient crawler. You can distribute it on several machines, so you don't have to run it on, on just one machine. Uh, it's Java based for, for a number of reasons. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's quite good. I mean, uh, it did the job for me, so I don't know if you know any other kind of good crawlers. Um, and then one of the other components is Python tag, uh, which is kind of a low interactive uh, client for browsing pages. Uh, again, it's well, well developed. Uh, it's, you know, the last version is March 2014. Sometimes I do some patches, so I contribute to this project. So it's still kind of a work in progress. But it currently detects uh, around 161 Explorer, uh, and, you know, including Adobe, Shockwave, and, and Java Web Explorer. So it's quite good. It uses kind of a mix of a signature and uh, a more like behavioral based approach. So it, it, it kind of builds a, an abstract syntax tree for each uh, for each exploit. So even if if even if the exploit changes, you know, it tries to do this kind of trying to do a little bit of littering of code. It, it's still kind of uh, you know it's still be, uh, it's it's you know it's still kind of resilient to like you know like po polymorphic code. But yeah, it's it's a work in progress, so you don't expect too much. Um, so the other component, which is quite interesting, is um, uh, it's a patched uh, JavaScript monkey, uh, which is the interpreter that's used by the Mozilla organization. So you can, you know, you have the source code, so you can recompile the JavaScript, and you can add, like, you know, you can hook uh, particular functions. And then, so, you know, from, from, that, uh, from a security perspective, I was very interested to know, like, given a, a JavaScript, um, um, you know, source uh, or file. I wanted to know, like, how many document write uh, were executed, uh, were executed on that particular uh, code. How many string instances they were created? Uh, how many element instances were created? How many object instances? How many evals? Uh, that's you know probably you know why. Uh, how many location operations were done? You know, like location is like host, um, you know, hash, host, uh, host, host name, href, origin port. How many uh, escape and unescape they were executed? How many encodes? So encode URI, decode URI, and how many decodes from from you know from the component <coughs> perspective? So the only things I didn't put yet is the cookie because that's quite important. Yeah, I, I didn't do that yet. So this kind of presented some old results. And the nice thing, if you have an, an encrypted uh, or an obfuscated uh, component, uh, this is fairly, you know, fairly easy. I couldn't put anything on a slide that was, you know, like complicated. So I just put some very basic. But if you have like uh, an obfus uh, obfuscated uh, JavaScript code like this, uh, I can get anything because, you know, I, I'm at the interpreter level. I can get, I can get the, you know, the, the output, uh, you know, just the obfuscated. So this one was doing. Uh, Oh yeah, this one was, was doing some exfiltration. So we're trying to basically get the uh, referer from, from, from the chronicle page and send it to, to, uh, from, to another website. Uh, and then, so as you can see, I can, in this case, there were like four string instances, there was a document write, uh, there were two evals, and there were no operations on, on the object side. Um, two, two, two. So, Version three of Web Detector. I'm plan. I'm, I'm planning. You know, if I have time to do a Django app. So, 
So currently, everything is kind of console-based, so you need, to, you need to type everything from the command line, so it's not very user-friendly. But the idea is that we'll put a web interface where you can create your job tasks and you can put new rules like, oh, I want to detect this specific uh, threat or something like that. Um, there are other tools uh, that, that can do a better job to analyze JavaScript. There is Dodzol, it was developed by Microsoft. Um, so, but yeah, I want to make it more as, ex as extensible as possible. And for anonymization, so like in my experience, you know, I was, I was setting a Tor on my own machine, but some of the time you might forgot to run that. So <laughs> uh, like, I, like, like, so my, my, my personal experience, I like to say <laughs> I was using a Raspberry Pi with Onion Pi. So I was actually sure that if I was on that particular Wi-Fi access point, then it was encrypted. So, you know, in that way, you can't, you know, you don't forget that you're, maybe you are not, uh, you're anonymized or not. So, you know, just in my personal experience, so you, maybe if you're more careful, you, you probably remember to turn it off and off and turn again. Uh, so this is more like uh, the, the kind of pipeline I do. So you take from the URL, you do the crawl, you ingest the, all the resources, you index it, you do analysis. So I start from the HTML, I extract all the components, so I get the JavaScript. If it doesn't contain uh, DOM, uh, DOM manipulations, I run it through the monkey patch. So I can do that kind of profiling. If it contains the JavaScript uh, you know, DOM manipulation, I pass it to the Python tag, which is this kind of uh, low client interactive, and then I produce a, a report. And this is like an interesting thing. Okay, so there were like uh, 13 websites you can see for each website, there are like the uh, distributions for each of these uh, six function calls for JavaScript. And I just a question for you, like, can you find, how can I phrase this? Can you find like, um, in this, in this, for this particular bar chart, can you find, uh, or do you think uh, which, webs, which websites are malicious and which one are not? Five to 13 are malicious. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yes, okay, okay. So there are two groups of, uh, you can see there are two groups roughly because you can see, right, okay. But yeah, uh, anybody else has an either idea? If you, there are two groups, yeah, so, but yeah. Anybody, okay. Y you almost got there, except for the fact that it's the, it's the opposite, so. <laughs> but yeah, no, you got the two groups. But uh, yeah, so the first four websites were, um, I can't put the real names, but they were like, uh, you know, they were distributing a lot, so they were full of malware and, and especially JavaScript and stuff like that. And then those are the, one, the, the other ones that were the good ones. So there was MySpace. I don't know if anybody used MySpace anymore, but yeah, it's still online. <laughs> uh, there was HillaryClinton.com, which is a real website. I thought it was like a fake, but it's, it's really the website of Hillary Clinton. You know, I think I was getting some porn website, I don't know, when I was Googling, but yeah, the dot .com is, a, is the legit one, so you, can, you know, it's f safe for browsing. <laughs> uh, some Yahoo, Ye what's a fright catalog? YouTube and photofile.russia, it's a legit website, so there are, it's not about porn. Um, so the, the interesting thing, um, for the kind of malicious ones, you can see, the object, well, that's kind of intuitive, right? The object instance profile, it's much higher compared to, to a good one. So if you see the ratio between the element instance and the object instance for a good one, it's almost percent But if you go for, for a malicious one, you have obviously a large number of object instances compared to the element instance. And also, like, string instances are much higher and it's probably because, you know, if you see this kind of, uh, you know, kind of malicious JavaScript, they try to do a lot of, uh, you know, they, they take a string, they, it's encrypted, they kind of reverse the string, and then they try to execute code. So that's probably my explanation for that. So there is a lot of much more proportion of string instance manipulations compared to, to a good one. Uh, I was expecting more document rights from the malicious ones, but there were few. So, you know, because sometimes, you know, they can create some, uh, you know, uh, like they create, uh, I don't know, um, click jacking thing, but, but probably it's not that much compared to, c compared to what the legit websites do when they create new dog, you know, they, maybe, maybe you have a, a div, creating new divs, creating new divs, so it's probably that what it is. Uh, but yeah, so that's just an interesting profile to, uh, to uh, look at. And evals were higher, well, 
EVAS, you can't really see the difference. Uh, it's kind of spread, so you get even good websites using small uh, number of EVAS. Um, I think there was the, the escape. Escape was interesting. So like good website, a lot, a lot of escapes and bad ones, they don't have so many escapes. So that was kind of counterintuitive. That's the surprising part. You would think yes. it would be the opposite. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, it was, it was I don't know if it's just because of this particular data set, so but. So your average developer actually codes less securely than your average malware sites, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, that's, yeah, that's, probably, that's probably true. That's probably true. Uh, so because I'm a machine learning, Expert, I, I said, oh, let's uh, let's apply a uh, very simple uh, classification. Uh, so I used uh, naive bi bias or decision tree. In this case, it just gives you 100 percent accuracy. Well, it was a small data set, so I had like 85 good website, like good websites and 64 bad. So this is you know this is like bad machine learning, right? So it's kind of overfitting, right? You say, oh, I have 100 percent accuracy, but you know my my data set is very small. But just to give you an idea, so you can see that you can kind of say what is a good one and what's a bad one. So you can kind of measure these six features, and you can say, oh, if you know, like, uh, if the features are in that particular range, then it's a good website. Otherwise, it's a bad website. But you can train your classifier as you as you gather more data. Uh, just to uh, this is like edit tricks. So after you have done your crawling job, it will give you kind of a uh, a summary of all your content on your web pages. So, like, you will say how many, you know, like a percentage of MIMI types. So, in terms of resources, how many HTTP errors you get, the response codes. So, you can use that as a, you know, like you, you can find stuff, think interesting things there. But um, so, just to give you an idea, this is like a kind of a report you get out from the system. So, we name. So, we'll give you all these numbers like, uh, you know, things that were found, and then it will basically tell you, oh, this is good, 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 and there were two bad ones. Um, so just for a quick overview, so if, if you have, like, say, 10 websites and you want to do it quickly, so you can just, uh, you know, tell me about, the, like, the risk uh, for, for each website. And, uh, this is like Python tag, so the output is quite simple. So I think it's based on meet, meet, meet report uh, structure. It will just tell you, okay, I've, uh, what was this, the uh, UM? Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I kind of, the URL was a French website, and there was, um, there was this explore, which was server console overflow. Uh, it will tell you the CV number, when, when it was found, and you know on which, on which page were, were, was found, so you can you know you can consider that as your a signature of a potential attack. Uh, this is some real data uh, I was running, so I decided, oh, let, let's see what do I find on my own WordPress website, which wasn't <laughs> updated uh, very often, I have to say. So so if you go there, it's at your own risk. <laughs> uh, well, it's just a standard website sort of thing. So oh, you know I didn't find anything like looks clean. Uh, you know, I run my updates maybe every month or something like that. But then it was, you know, just just for curiosity, and there was something like uh, like 14 of uh, was it March or something like that. There was there was yeah there was a drop. I think it was like uh, so you can see there was an IP, which was in numerical format and that's kind of very suspicious. P2P and then there was something like a PDF, right? And then obviously the PDF was containing a, an exploit inside. Uh, and yeah, I picked it up. It was removed at the time because there was a 403, but it was there for, I don't know, like uh, for how many days because that was my first uh, crawling of my website. Uh, and, you know, it tells me the page where it was found when, when, when in the kind of destination of the URI. Uh, there were interesting outgoing links. So, like, oh, there was bitdiabetes.us. And that was on my a subfolder on my kind of uh, uh, Android thing. And unfortunately, like, yeah, as I said, it was already there when it was crawling. So, you know, I couldn't, I didn't know when exactly that happened just because it was crawling later. Uh, yeah, so I discovered that was, so I was speaking maybe some sort of advertise, you know, diabetes, it's a good cause. But yeah, it was full of stuff. Uh, uh, it was just like a, a hijacked domain and we're putting lots of things. And then there was, this was not on my website. It was just crawling uh, some, somebody else's website. And there was a form redirection. So you can see there was a customer 
that was quite bad. So there was like .com something customers, some mid PHP, and it was going to somewhere else. So somebody had managed to inject some, uh, you know, um, XSS, and it was manipulating the DOM to f submit the form somewhere else. So that was very good. I mean, very basic, very basic detection, but I was able to pick that up, so I was quite happy. Um, that was my website, so it was, you know, as you know, I was browsing that, and actually I couldn't see, but the the the, the spammy link was here, so it was like bit, bit diabetes, <laughs> and then the malware was somewhere. The malware link to download the thing was somewhere on this on the left side, and I was trying to do some investigation, but what happened was essentially there were there was a plugin a WordPress. It was hosted on GitHub. They, the attacker managed to push some code that was adding this kind of, uh, you know, somehow uh, cross-site scripting. So it was a JavaScript that was generating these links. But yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not an app, you know, a pen test or anything. So I wasn't. I mean, I kind of say, oh, okay, it's interesting, but I didn't really go to investigate. Uh, and uh, so the system is kind of uh, Git-like, so you can see. You know, from, from a particular resource, this was bit diabetes in the US, it was kind of took down. But you can see like previous versions, so you can see, oh, let, let me see how the page looked like during the first crawl. So you can actually see on your website uh, how the, you know, what happened to that particular page to see for like something that was added or something that was removed. So you can see the dates, you can click on those dates and it will show you how the page looked like on, uh, on different dates. Um, so after analyzing all these kind of things, uh, you get the report. So it measures how many exploits were detected, uh, all the kind of profiling information. And so for each website, you will, I just made a score uh, that goes from low to high, and then you will say, oh, so this website is a high risk of uh, being compromised, and then you can, you can decide if you want to investigate or not. Uh, so everything is in CSV format. Uh, okay, since I'm going to close up very soon, uh, thing, <coughs> things that I've learned again, yeah, analytics is much better than, you know, like standard W get. Um, you get plenty of rules, and so like if you say, if you're crawling something, uh, you know, and you want to know, okay, I, I'm not interested in images, so you can filter down particular resources. You can avoid all these tricks. So, well, you know, if you have a malicious website, they will try to do this kind of, um, uh, they will try to basically nest you in a in an infinite loop of pages, so you just crawl on that page forever. So, uh, so analytics have all these kind of uh, uh, heuristics to you know to uh, not being fooled by this kind of tricks. So, I, so it, brought, it crawls very well. Uh, you can add plugins, so you can add things to save uh, your resources in a different database and stuff like that. Um, so, to, I was a little bit disappointed by Tor because he only uses socks. Uh, and so you always need to set up a proxy on the host. I thought, you know, it would be better if it was something that was using, like, on the same machine uh, that was, like, a, a proxy uh, directly, but only, I don't know why they didn't provide, like, a uh, decision, an architectural decision from them. And there was something about DNS leaking, so you need to be very careful when you, when you configure Tor by default, it, it won't prevent DNS, DNS leaking, so you need to be careful about that. Um, uh, yeah, it's, so, you know, doing passively, there are so many things. Um, so there, there was an interesting thing that I was mm, thinking about. So how do you actually know that a web page, so how do you know that the original behavior of that pa page was good or bad? Uh, because when I parse these things, okay, I, say, I see JavaScript, but it's really hard to tell if, you know, it was somebody, was something legit or not. Um, so there are simple things you can say, okay, so if you see like an image that has a very long onload function, JavaScript function, you, you can kind of get these rules, but it's really hard to say, I mean, except for like a sp very simple, uh, uh, you know, cross-site scripting uh, behaviors, it's really hard to say what kind of was the intended behavior of that page. Uh, so that's, I'm still thinking about how to do that efficiently. Um, okay, so analytics equals a Java environment. Uh, there are plenty of rules and plugins you can use. Uh, there are things that I that didn't do yet, so it's like check for cookie manipulation, uh, and then uh, check cross site scripting also on other events like on load, uh, on mouse over, image sources, and other things. Uh, I think there is a list in uh, all was the ten. There's a list of uh, kind of common XSS manipulations that 
if I have time, we'll put in the system so I can I can detect those. Um, boop, boop, boop. Uh, so the next version will be on Django, a Django app with this kind of uh, with a graphical interface. Uh, currently, that's an annoying thing. Is Elytrix free? have this kind of compressed format, which is called uh, WARC. So at the moment, it's kind of a little bit annoying. So I take this kind of dump of the website, and then I create um, kind of uh, an index function, uh, version of that on a, on a database. You can do it that directly. So if you write a plugin for Elytrix that will spit out the resources directly to a database, it will be better. So you don't have this kind of intermediate representation, so which you know might uh, be not very good for consistency or so there are a number of things I want to improve and maybe an API uh, RESTful interface for automation so you can actually you know if you're sitting on another machine you can just uh, write a request and say oh I want to crawl this uh, you know like every every two days so you can kind of do everything kind of semi in a semi automated fashion uh, maybe add some sort of malware blacklist for, for IP um, extend this tag plugin so you can you can you can detect more stuff. Uh, maybe plugins for this kind of uh, more advanced uh, JavaScript analysis. So Zozo is like so we have three technologies. One is for uh, IP, um, IP, IP overflow, stack overflow, and we get uh, another one for generic um, exploitation of just, uh, JavaScript structures. Uh, but it's kind of proprietary, so I don't know if they will allow me to do that. It's just <coughs> just some ideas. Um, how many minutes? Is it done? Yeah. Just about out of time, sir. Okay. Good. So, so the project will be on GitHub at some point when, when, the, when I get proper stable build. Uh, the Vagrant image will be on the cloud, so you can kind of download it directly. And yeah, if you want to contact me, the, you know, you can just send me an email. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you... Do you know any, any other ideas that can uh, complement what I'm doing would be quite nice. Or questions. Okay. Paolo, I love the presentation. <laughs> okay. So, but after all this build up, it's yes. not yet open source, right? So we have to wait. Any idea how long that might be? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's, yeah, I mean, every tool that I use is open source, and uh, I mean, I can, I can push it today if I want to, to GitHub. It's just I want to, there are like some, I want to make the Vagrant uh, uh, script better because right now it's kind of semi-manual, so you need to, so I just, just, I mean, it's open source, there's no problem to publish, it's just, uh, it takes some time. Yeah, I would probably, uh, you know, like, contact all was once, right. once it's online, but so, yeah. Quick question, so Heretics, uh, yes. The, 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 scr the crawler that you're using. Yes. You said that it works as opposed to WGET on dynamic sites. Yes. Right. Yes. Well, what if I have a site that makes a request back, grabs some JSON data, populates, puts links? Because <laughs> you know, uh, what do you do in those situations? Mm, have you considered question. using, for example, a headless browser so that it would actually execute the JavaScript, go grab links, and then you would yeah. to crawl through that? Yeah. So. Python da, tag does that. Um, oh, tag does do that. Yeah, so does do it kind of simulates clicks as well. So you can see all that. Yeah. Let's simulate the guy clicking. Uh, I wasn't sure if it said like honey pot, or so I wasn't sure. Yeah, was. uh, I kind of do intermediate now. So I start from the from the base website, and then I say, okay, let's start from the home page. Let's scroll like five levels with Python tag. But the problem is, then it gets slower. So I wanted to have a compromise between kind of fast and slow. And usually, if the people put uh, malware, it's usually between the first levels of, of your website. But yeah, it's something that I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about, like how to compromise between speed and code. Yeah, it was a good question. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, I can detect minified versions, so that's quite easy. Um, there are some, I can't remember, so there are, okay, there are some obfuscation uh, kind of tools that look, I can't remember the name of the company, but there are some, you know, the one that are like one very professional obfuscation tools that you have to pay for that usually. Uh, those are, they look very malicious because most of the things they do, it's, yeah, to be honest, it's not, it's not, it's not nice JavaScript. Uh, but it's kind of the boundary, like what do you define 
kind of you know normal behavior or not. Yeah, in those cases, it's less accurate. So it might give you some false positives. Yeah, because so th that's what what I was thinking. Like so, once you get the the obfuscated version, then you want to do this kind of behavior analysis. That's another kind of second layer of analysis. But yeah, it's yeah, it's a good question. It's true. It's harder. <laughs> Is it some, okay, sorry, yeah. Have you found or uh, done over the last two years ago uh, um, med, uh, sites which are hosting Viagra or Cialis uh, advertisements, compromised sites? So you're asking if, yeah, okay. Available normally uh, not through the site. I mean, you can't get them via crawling. Normally uh, they are referred by a search engine. You search uh, on Google sites. Yes, okay. So the question is, can I find, yeah, this kind of Viagra advertised website from, which are only indexed by Google by doing a search. Um, so, the, okay, so the way I did it for bad website, I was just, um, so there are two things. Some websites, they don't allow you, uh, they don't crawl properly if they discover that the origin referrer was not from Google. So, and, you know, because they want to avoid people kind of crawling and say, oh, that's something suspicious. So they will actually see if the referrer was not from Google and say, oh, that's like a blank page. So somebody like started to crawl directly on my website. That's suspicious. So they have a JavaScript code that kind of do something different. So they look legit. Uh, and yeah, the way to bypass that, you can either simulate a search from Google uh, to bypass that one uh, or yeah, or kind of analyze the JavaScript and try to find, yeah, it's, it's not, it's, yeah, it's something, I did try directly from Google, like to, like to simulate that, and that worked, but from, from website to go to, like the advertiser was a little bit trickier, yeah, because there are usually two or three ops that, that require to, to find the original advertiser. Yeah, it's not that easy, so you need to crawl more, and, but then becomes very, the tree becomes very wide, so yeah, but it's a good question. Okay. Is that it, folks? Okay, okay thank, thank you, you very much. No problem. <laughs>